Hello everyone and welcome to this first episode of Delta Dialogues. Uh, your interactive community call uh, that gives the latest developments in this exciting world of integrated photonics. My name is Joran Smeets and I'll be your host today. Before we get started, I would like to briefly explain to you the concept of this new initiative. So Delta Dialogues is going to take place on every first Wednesday of the month and we'll give all the, update, all the relevant updates in the field. We'll provide a stage to new partners to introduce themselves and also give keynotes on relevant topics for you. So feel free to ask any questions that you might have in the chat or any insights or any ideas that you, that you want to share. And I will be getting them from this iPad and can address them to the various speakers that we'll be speaking today. And who knows that you will become a presenter in the next edition of Delta Dialogues. So of course, as this is a new thing, the first editions might be a bit bumpy. Yeah, and we won't have all the answers here for you, but that's also what this call is for. We are asking you, the community, to share your, your insights and your answers. So you can do that through the chat, and sometimes we will ask someone to unmute himself and to speak. So there's a, a variety of speakers lined up for you today, and uh, these speakers will be made presenters, uh, and they can then unmute themselves and share their screen. We will also, after this event, give you a feedback form in which you can fill out in a couple of minutes what you thought about this and how we can improve this so it can be more valuable to you and the rest of the audience. So a quick overview of the program for today. We will start off with my very own colleague, Ewit Roos, who will tell us more about the developments around the National Growth Fund proposal, which was in the news a couple of weeks ago. Then after, we will have three cool startups to pitch their ideas in two minutes presentations. After that, we will have no one less than Kathleen Philips from iMac Netherlands to share some very nice insights with us about the CMOS industry. And last but not least, Twan Kortorst from Synopsis to give us a keynote as well. So again, feel free to ask any questions in the chat. My colleague Susanna will give them on to me on this iPad and I can address them to the speakers. So let's start. So to start, my very, my very own colleague Ewit Roos, he's CEO of Photon Delta and he has been leading the organization since 2016. He was the driving force behind the National Growth Fund proposal, so it's a very good opportunity to pick his brains on what's happening now. So Ewit, thank you and good to have you here today. And I can say for the entire community that it was a quite a ride in the couple last months that we had, right? Well, I would say uh, not just a couple of months. Uh, I think it was uh, quite a year. Yes. Yeah. yeah. With all the preparations and consulting our colleagues, uh, our partners, that uh, was quite some effort. But um, very important to do that because now we have a, a well prepared. Uh, and thought through proposal, which ultimately got granted as well. And we are very happy with that, of course. Yes, exactly. Very great. And also, of course, congratulations to all the partners that are in this call today. <coughs> um, so maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the National Growth Fund. So what, what is it for exactly? The National Growth Fund as such is an initiative of the Dutch government. I think it's lost, it, it was launched uh, three years ago and they made a budget available of uh, 20 billion euros for a period of four years in tranches of 5 billion per, uh, per year for basically uh, R&D, innovation projects and, and, and to make a long story short, it is about how can we ensure with all kinds of innovations, the kind of welfare that we currently have in the Netherlands. Uh, so, so, so basically ensuring that we keep up in the world and, and support our GBP also in the next uh, decennia. And, and innovation is a key driver for that, as we all know. So that's a growth fund. And we had a first tranche last year, and this was the second tranche that, made, that came available. 
and we applied for this second trench and we worked I think almost 12 months to, to make a proposal. And photonics is a apparently but we knew that a, a strategic asset of the Netherlands and consistently supported by the Dutch government and by the granting of this growth fund proposal which is about 470 million co contribution from the Dutch government so from the Dutch taxpayers and an additional 700 million something like that uh, uh, from industry in which they again say this is important for the Netherlands we trust and we rely on the industrial and academic community to bring this forward and to make a difference in the future with this new technology or with this technology with this new industry which is key enabling not just for the Netherlands uh, but also a key enabling technology in Europe and apparently uh, also for the whole world. Yes, that's uh, that's uh, true, and I think we can be very grateful also for the continued support, but also to see the support from industry, which was uh, quite impressive. So this total amount of 1.1 billion euros is quite an astonishing amount. Huh? Uh, how does that work? Does it get wired to a bank account uh, like that, or this uh, uh, this 1.1 billion consists of. A, a 470 million grant which will be released in, in, in two tranches one for the first three years another one for the last three years the program takes six years for the first tranche of 266 million um, we have to f basically fulfill kind of all kinds of conditions to really get that but the majority of that money will be granted to Photon Delta as a, as a subsidy, taking into account the co-funding, etc. of our partners. So at the end of the day, yeah, that money will be transferred to a bank account, to the Photon Delta bank account. And we have the responsibility and the trust of the Dutch government that we uh, allocate that based on the proposal, the programs, the projects, and the targets we set uh, in our proposal. Um, does that answer the question? Yes, yes. No, I think that's uh, that's 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 interesting um, and, and and good to know. Um, and talking about those projects and targets, like what are the most important things that Photon Delta and the ecosystem is going to do with this uh, with this money? Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? Definitely. The whole reason for applying on the, or to the growth fund with this proposal is about that we are currently live in a totally different geopolitical situation as we did uh, three years ago or four years ago, when we got our first support from the Dutch government. And, and, and one of the main differences is that Europe is aiming for or, or is aiming for a kind of strategic autonomy in the in these those key enabling technologies like photonics and what does that mean basically it means we need to have a security of supply um, we need to be able to serve industry with their products so going back to your question accelerating the industrialization of this of this technology is a key driver and it should be a key outcome uh, of our proposal meaning scaling so more volume better performance continuously improving the performance so robust uh, predictable and and the best quality of photonic integrated circuits the best quality in designs the best quality in packaging, front end, back end. And that, that needs to be in line with each other. So industrialization in terms of scaling, 
performance, continuous innovation in making better products is one of the key drivers. As well as, as, well as integration, meaning that our, our photonic integrated circus should not only serve the products we make here in the Netherlands and in Europe, but should also have a position in other value chains in the world, depending on the kind of products they make there, depending on the applications. Because that's, I think, one of the most important positions that the Netherlands can acquire, is to become a kind of Taiwan or a TSMC uh, for, for, for the world. Taiwan is a very small country, but they make PICs or ICs, electronic ICs, sorry, sorry, for the whole world. And that's what, what we envision with Photon Delta as well, that we make our photonic integrated circuits uh, and even some modules uh, for the rest of the world. So our export potential is, uh, is, is definitely at stake here. Then another part of this growth fund proposal is, is, is about developing the right application technologies. And some, some key strategic technologies, like for example for Datacom and Telecom, uh, bandwidth, uh, reduced food, uh, energy footprints, they're going to be, that's going to be important for the whole, of, for the whole world. But also um, medical applications, um, quantum photonics, mm -hmm. they're all part of this uh, proposal. And you have to have sincere knowledge and expertise about what these applications to require on specifications and functionalities. And those functionalities to enable them with photonic integrated circuits, determine the quality of your library of which you take your building blocks. Your building blocks in which the foundries, Lionics, smart photonics, can build the photonic uh, integrated circuits with. And that's going to be a key asset. But you cannot have a world-class library of those building blocks if you do not know what the functionality is all about, if you do not have sufficient expertise on those applications. So application technology is the second driver of this proposal. The last one is the ecosystem as a whole. So, so what do we need there? Of course talent. The whole world is crying out loud for talent. Yes, uh, so so that's, uh, that's, that's definitely a very important topic. But also international positioning. With who do we work? Because the proposal is also about strengthening our strengths, but cooperate on expertise that we do not have in the Netherlands. Yep. We cannot do it alone. Yes. So we cannot do it alone. Yep. So therefore we have, for example, is a very strong partnership uh, with IMAC in this proposal, because they provide knowledge, expertise and exposure on CMOS uh, and silicon photonics. And that makes us strong. Um, strategical, strategic sovereignty is not about doing things just on your own. It's about mutual dependency and cooperation. Uh, and that's what ecosystem development is also all about. The last thing about the ecosystem is about to continue the support the financial support, but also expertise of startups and scale-ups. Mm. When we look at the value of debt for high-tech or deep-tech uh, companies in, in our domain, it's deep, capital intensive, a lot of money, that's what you need when you develop an application with photonic integrated circuits based upon that. It takes time also. It yeah. takes time. But it's also a long value of that, because for the production front and back end, you are dependent on a whole supply chain. And that supply chain, as you could learn from the industrialization chapter in this proposal, is, is not, does not have that maturity yet, uh, at least some parts not. So it's a continuously iterative process 
of becoming more mature, becoming better, uh, but we are not there yet. Otherwise, you wouldn't need this proposal. Obviously, yes. So. Well, thank you very much for those uh, for this information. And um, I think we can have a one last uh, question before we continue to the startups. I'm sure they must be very eager to present their, their ideas, of course. Uh, again, if you have any questions for Ewit, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat so we can, we can uh, ask them to him. Um, but let's, let's go to the next one. Um, so uh, how are our uh, partners going to be involved and what are the next steps for them? Two answers, because I want to keep it short, mm -hmm. but it's a very important question. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that. Well, first of all, many partners are already involved uh, in, this, in this program because they were part of, let's say, the construction, the composition of, of, this, uh, of this growth fund proposal. Um, but that does not mean that those who were not involved in the writing or contribute uh, concepts, thoughts, uh, or expertise in this proposal will not be involved in the next stage. On the contrary, we need all kinds of contributions from different partners, application companies uh, in the field of agri-food, in the field of data com and telecom, biosensing, medical sensors, fiber optic sensing, and of course, uh, the, quantum, uh, the quantum technologies to become part of this journey. Because part of this six year program is also to incorporate front running innovations in all those fields to become stronger and better as an ecosystem mm -hmm. and to become attractive as an ecosystem for the whole world. So, so we welcome definitely all new participants or all new parties who do have something to contribute in content, in business to this ecosystem and work with this ecosystem to, to, join, this, to join this next step in the development of this wonderful, ambitious, industrial ecosystem. Very good. I think there is a question that is very related to what you were just explaining. Yeah? So we welcome everyone, you say. Uh, does it matter uh, from what part of the world? Because Optech BB is saying that they have some partners from Thailand and India that both expressed very serious interest in, in joining this proposal. Is there anything, uh, I mean, is this proposal also open for them? D definitely. Okay. Definitely. They can join uh, programs and projects that we have in the pipeline and that we have to develop and set up uh, in, this, uh, in this program. Just to make one thing clear, this proposal is to meet challenges, is to, to book results. And everyone that can contribute to realizing those results and, and meeting those challenges uh, is potentially a partner. Good. And it's not the other way around. We have got a lot of money from the Dutch government and we drop it and hopefully something comes out. No, there will be steering, there will be managing uh, on those processes. So also regarding the question who will contribute and who can contribute, the carrot and the stick as we call it. You have to mean something for our ecosystem and then you can enjoy the cooperation. So. Okay, very good. Um, so, so can partners expect like maybe some calls or will they get approached in the next months or how does, how does that work? Uh, calls is, uh, is, is, is not the way we gonna use it um, so far, mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely, uh, but that's what we already see. I mean, companies take the initiative to get in touch. Yeah. And over the last two weeks, I got, I got emails from all over the world, not just to get in touch with us, but also regarding the question, how can we co cooperate? Because it's not always about money. It's also about if we can deliver 
what we promise as an ecosystem. We have customers all around the world who make use of that and who want to contribute in development and even provide efforts and support to make their goals happen based on this technology. Yeah. Okay. I think on that note, we can, uh, we can conclude this discussion for now. Um, if anyone has any other further questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or send us an email and we'll, we'll get in touch with you, of course. And I think this is the good moment to move on to the next item on the, on the agenda, which are the startups. We have three very nice startups lined up for you. One, and that's AFI, also a very interesting startup. Uh, for AFI, we have Esther Spanier uh, in the call with us. Uh, she's a clinical research specialist at Damcon. At the same time, she's also managing director uh, of Hemix, a medical device company. Uh, before that, she worked at the University of Twente, and I'm sure she will have some very interesting stories for us to share. Uh, Esther, if you could unmute yourself, share your video and share your screen, then you can uh, talk to the audience. Yes, good afternoon. Um, just selecting my presentation. Okay, thanks. Uh, so indeed, I'm going to tell something about AFI. Um, I work at Demcon, but I'm very closely involved in the AFI um, project, so um, that's why uh, I was asked. So AFI is a, um, a medical company, um, uh, a legal manufacturer of medical devices. It's a startup, but it has um, um, been started already some time ago by Michel Vleugels, who was a gynecologist. And he said, when I'm operating, um, I am missing something. I am not able to feel what I am touching or manipulating compared to uh, the general surgery that was performed before. So I will discuss a little bit about that. So, of course, we have seen in surgery um, yeah, some changes. And one important change is that um, if, uh, before we had uh, open surgery and now we have minimally invasive surgery or laparoscopic surgery. And this has uh, many advantages for the patient. Smaller scars, less pain, less infections, uh, but also faster recovery. And, and uh, so it also uh, saves money in the end for the hospitals, which is also important. Um, but there are also some downsides to this, and especially on the surgery on the surgeon side. So you have a very different movement that you uh, have to do. Uh, you have straight stick surgery, so uh, you have your tools into the abdomen, but you don't have your wrist to use. And also the motion is inverted uh, compared to how you would normally operate. And then the most important aspect that we are trying to solve in AVI is the loss of touch. So you cannot feel your tissue anymore. And uh, that also partly has to do with the friction that is there in the graspers that you're using. Um, and a lot of it you compensate by visual feedback, but um, this is really something that um, uh, in surgery uh, we are looking for. What can be um, our next step in this minimally invasive surgery? So this this touch, this feeling of tissue, uh, normally this is uh, or how we are, um, uh, you know, going on in daily life. This is a very complex process between what you're feeling with your fingertips, but also what you are seeing and how your brain interacts with that and what you are doing in with movement and your joints and, uh, and that kind of feedback. So this is all um, lost in minimally invasive surgery, and we have developed a tool, uh, a prototype, which aims to solve this, at least partly. Um, so this tool measures at the tip, and uh, with the control uh, box here, uh, gives some feedback back to the surgeon uh, about tissue resistance, about tissue characteristics. And how do we do that? So we have uh, an optical sensor in the tip of our grasper. It's a, a fiber break rating sensor, uh, which measures the force that is exerted on the grasper or here on the on the end of the grasper, and that is then, um, yeah, given back to the surgeon to the surgeon with a motor which is located here in the handle, and this force that is measured here at the tip is then amplified and is uh, the surgeon feels this force with the trigger, so on his fingertips. So that is what the system is doing. 
there are some advantages to this um, optical sensor uh, compared to uh, an electrical sensor, which is, for example, that it is um, less sensitive to uh, EMC from the outside world, um, that it's small, that can be easily positioned at the tip because you don't need an electrical cable there. Um, but there are also some challenges, so we are still working out some of these challenges, and we are currently working with two partners, which is Demcom, of course, uh, but also Technovis, and they are responsible for the optical part of the system. So this is a project that is still going on, and we're working towards uh, a next prototype that will be CE certified in Europe. And the last uh, sheet is a movie which shows you what we have already achieved in our previous prototypes. So here you can see the artery that is held, that is pulsating, and you see here the trigger that is moving together with this pulsation. So the surgeon feels this um, yeah, on its fingertip, as you can see here. Okay, that was my presentation. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Esther, for this uh, for this for this interesting presentation. Um, I think you have a wonderful product. I'm sure that uh, it's going to uh, take off in the in the upcoming time. Um, I think uh, we have one question uh, from the uh, from the audience for you. Um, this is from Mike Richardson, also from Optech DB. Um, Sorry, uh, how, uh, so okay, wow, he says, haptics included with uh, lapscropy. Not sure if that's, uh, how uh, are you working, uh, so are you working with EIT? And uh, what about non-surgical use of this force sensing? For example, food rheological testing or something. Is that something that you have looked at? Um. Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, so I, as I said, I'm uh, indeed responsible for, for this project and more from the clinical side. So my focus is mainly the medical aspects of it. So, um, but I think I will take this question uh, back to the AV company uh, to have answered. Sure. All right. So then, uh, if there's no further questions, we can move on to the next speaker. And um, I would like to thank you very much, Esther, for this presentation. Uh, if there's any further questions coming in, we will forward them to you, and then you can uh, you can be put in touch with the people asking. Uh, so we had a little problem with Marijn uh, before from a technical point of view, but I think we are good right now. So Marijn van Os, uh, do you hear us? I there hear you, you are. And I hope you can hear me as well now. Yes, we can. Wonderful. So the floor is yours. If you can please share your screen and uh, enlighten us about uh, about Skin Vivo. So. This is Vivo. Schifo. We are developing a um, new tech generation uh, cancer discovery uh, in order to see two millimeters deep inside tissues in vivo, so in the human body. So everywhere where we can go inside with a normal working channel, we are able to look forward inside a tissue. Um, and it's very important because it is actually missing right now, because when you look to MRI or CT, that has a resolution of uh, the one, two millimeters and uh, for really early cancer detection for a known patient, uh, you need to look really with a high resolution in those one or two millimeters. Also, given the fact that the number of cancer patients is increasing rapidly over time due to aging populations, um, we need a paradigm change in the medical world. And we provide with our tool basically because we can do more personalized treatment by a better diagnosis and an earlier diagnosis and we can prevent operations. We have been selecting the bladder case a cancer, bladder cancer as the starting point to start with. And that's for a few reasons, uh, because the bladder cancer is very, it comes back a lot and you have to look inside the two millimeter bladder wall. Is it cancer what is going through the bladder wall? So is it muscle invasive or is it non-muscle invasive? The sooner you know that, the better you can treat the patient and also faster, which is increasing survival rate of those patients a lot. Um, with our OCT catheter, uh, we basically provide OCT light inside this two millimeter tissue. And then we have roughly a factor 4,000 more pixels than compared to a one by one millimeter range. So that's a very high resolution 
basically kind of echo image you get. And we are able to really distinguish the different layers of this bladder wall, including muscle layer, and that's really important for the urologist. Uh, the treatment of bladder cancer patients is basically that you need to know as soon as possible, is it muscle invasive or not? And for that, they do a surgery, a full surgery on the, uh, and um, you need to take up to muscle layers away in order the pathologue is able to determine how far it's growing through the bladder wall. When it's through the bladder wall, you are muscle invasive uh, patient, you get a treatment with chemo, and then afterwards the bladder wall is removed by default in the guidelines. Um, when they have removed those bladder walls, the, the bladders, then they figure out that 20 to 30 percent of those bladders should have been stayed in the body, of course, stayed because they cannot find anything. So we claim that we want to spare one of one out of five of those bladders for those patient group. And we have 1000 of those patients where they remove the bladder a year in the Netherlands alone. For the other part of the group, it's in the non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. The recurrence is very high. That's what they know. So when they do a checkup again, what is lifetime going on, uh, you see that there's a huge need to really distinguish again, is this do we need to operate again? Yes or no? And uh, from a great Danish research, a really large population of uh, patients, they figured out that the number of operations which are unnecessary in that follow-up phase is more than 50%. Uh, so that's also a burden on the hospitals because you, you use capacity which you could have used for some other patients. And it's also a burden for the patient, but it's even also a financial burden for the for the hospitals because many of those operations are unnecessary or read operations which come on the account of the hospital and not on the account of the insurance company. Uh, so there we can save a lot of uh, time and by getting this catheter in the golden standard of bladder cancer diagnosed in the beginning, we could much faster diagnose if somebody is bladder well, cancer, muscle invasive, yes or no. And that can save lives because when you start treatment in uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer too late, the survival rate of this patient is really dropping dramatically. Uh, now the link to optics. We have mentioned already that we have an OCT source we use. Uh, we use OCT source. Uh, we have uh, focusing optics and fibers in the tip of the catheter. We have a uh, SOI wafer based a MEMS device, which is uh, scanning and to make, uh, well, uh, to make a line, to scan a line. And, and with that, we are able to scan a line from five millimeter in the bladder wall. And at that five millimeter, we go deep inside the bladder wall and we make the bladder wall structure visible for the urologist. Um, as I said, we will start with the uh, bladder. Uh, let me repeat first, this catheter is only two and a half millimeter in diameter. Uh, we aim for getting it smaller in the future as well. And this mirror is only one or one by 1.5 millimeter in die size. So it's pretty small all. Um, and it's needed because you need to go into the standard working channels of cystoscopes uh, used in the hospital. Um, once we have the bladder case done, we will step further for uh, in the lungs, in the prostate, in the hypophysor or in the colon or any laparoscopic operation where you want to have insight in the tissue where you're looking at, which you don't get when you look with a normal camera. Um, that's in a nutshell without slides. My apologize. I don't know why this screen sharing not working. Um, the story of Skin Vivo. Thank you very much, uh, Marijn. It's a very interesting uh, technology, and I think its purpose is uh, it's, it's very novel. Um, just uh, looking at the screen, if there's any questions coming in from the audience, so please don't forget to drop your questions in the chat so we can ask them to the speakers, right? Um, Marijn, uh, so, so this, with, with this product, is there, are you already, uh, okay, now you, you were explaining about the development of this, uh, of the technology for the bladder, uh, for bladder cancer applications. Uh, are you working with uh, specific, like with hospitals or how does, uh, how does this work? Yes, uh, we have, uh, we work specifically with the uh, Academical Medical Research Center in Amsterdam. So it's Amsterdam UMC called nowadays. Uh, we work with uh, St. Antonius in Nieuwegein. Um, we have 
contact with different urologists throughout Europe with somehow 10 people, uh, with among them uh, key opinion leaders who are responsible for the uh, guidelines writing. And so this is the guys from Denmark, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, France, uh, Britain, and also Germany. And so these we use for sparring to see where we are and to get their feedback, but also to start first clinical trials at some locations with them. Hmm. So we aim for this year clinical trial with the AMC in 15 patients. And then the next two years we aim for a multi-site trial to see if we can prove that with our technology we are able to spare bladders and that we are able to reduce the number of operations in the non nursing phase of bladder cancer treatment. Okay, it's very impressive also to see uh, how integrated photons can contribute to make something smaller so it becomes less invasive and you can actually implement it in existing stethoscopes as you were describing. I think someone in the chat is, uh, is interested to know more and is asking if you can maybe drop a URL to your website uh, so that they can read further. Uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Marijn, for your presentation. And um, uh, we're going to move to our last startup pitch. Um, we will have Daniele uh, Raiteri from Aircision. Daniele is the CTO of uh, Aircision and has been two years with the company. Before that, he was working at Hall Center and also has a long track record at NXP Semiconductors. Uh, Daniele, if you couldn't share your screen, put your microphone on, I think it's already happened, so I can see you on the screen. Good to have you here. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Now I just need to share my screen. And okay, so uh, I'm here to present the decision, so I will try to make it uh, quick and uh, clear for everybody. Um, this is a telecom application, and in decision we want to connect the unconnected. So according to UNESCO, 40.5% of household, households worldwide still have no access to the internet. And of course, uh, we imagine immediately about uh, countries in uh, South America, maybe, or uh, Africa, or in uh, Asia. Uh, that's true, but that's not the only case. So here we see on the left uh, an image from the White House, and that's the picture they have of the connectivity in the US. So it's a big red map where they see that uh, they need to improve connectivity. If you look at Europe, the story is very similar. I think uh, here in this region uh, we are very uh, lucky and very well connected. Fiber optics is everywhere. If we see the neighbors, uh, Germany, we see the distribution of connectivity and the uh, high data rate is very low. So there's a lot of things to do, both in uh, underdeveloped countries and in the, the most developed countries, I would say. So to solve this problem, uh, in a session we are developing uh, an FSO uh, modular platform, so a free space optics modular platform that is going to provide uh, high bandwidth over long range. It will provide network security and uh, it can be easily uh, deployed and uh, very quickly deployed. Our solution uh, is uh, consists of two main parts uh, of hardware. So a baseband unit that is uh, in charge of uh, collecting the data coming from a core network and generate the signal that is uh, transmitted to the free space to the other uh, to the other terminal. So this uh, signal is uh, transmitted by the optical head. This is the second component of uh, each end of the link. And the optical head is uh, in charge of uh, aligning the laser to transmit this signal very far. So imagine that the laser beam is very narrow and we have to hit a very small point at kilometers of distance. Especially the baseband unit is, uh, let's say, the, the part that we see most important in this ecosystem uh, and for the audience today, because uh, that is where we need uh, the support of uh, integrated photonics. Now most of the operations are done in uh, the electrical domain, and of course, it was mentioned in the beginning how uh, this is not power efficient and uh, integrated photonics can really help us to achieve a high higher performance uh, through the coherent modulation. So making transceivers that can uh, transmit a lot of uh, data in a very short amount of time. 
But we also need to aggregate all this data coming from different sources, and this is going to be a, a, a very important uh, uh, computational task. And for sure, the future it will be uh, in photonics. Now, at the moment, we are ready for our uh, first challenge. Uh, the company started in 2019. Uh, since then, we had many tests of uh, uh, our own. So in September 2020, we had the first proof of concept in a system that was uh, one gigabit per second at, uh, at 500 meters, and it was a single uh, direction communication. In May 2021, we demonstrated together with TNO communication at 10 gigabit per second at 2.5 kilometers. This was also a simplex communication, so only one transmitter and uh, one receiver. And since then, we started to integrate our own product, and uh, that's what we achieved in December 2021. So with this device, we could reach uh, uh, 10 gigabit per second communication at more than one kilometer's distance, full duplex communication, so ready to be integrated in a, a real case, in a real network. And that's what we are going to do in uh, June, from June to December. This will be the first uh, commercial pilot this is with the largest uh, European telecom operator. We will test in Prague. The distance will be six, six kilometers. So we are very uh, looking forward to this. Also because we will compare directly the FSO technology, so this laser-based technology and photonics-based technology, against uh, uh, standard technologies like RF solutions so, uh, in the E-band. Um, so we are really looking forward to that. And uh, of course, it's a big task, and for that we need a lot of people. Uh, this is the team. Uh, we have a very diverse team. We are based in Eindhoven. We have a lot of competencies, and that's uh, important also for the character of the people to be able to, let's say, step in in a lot of uh, critical moments when uh, you know many challenges in a startup we have to face, and that's very important uh, to have them as well. I think that that's it. Uh, of course. This is uh, my contest. You understand now I explain it. It's, uh, we are very interested in uh, coherent transceivers and integrated photonics for data aggregation, FEC, and actually one bullet that I forget here, it's uh, quantum, also quantum is very important. I mentioned the security point, and of course quantum technology is key in this. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniele, for your presentation. I think uh, it was very clear. Um, there was already quite some an some uh, questions dropped in the chat uh, that have been answered uh, by your colleague Betsy Lindsay. Uh, I think there's maybe one last one. Ah, there's a, okay, I see Betsy's already typing there, so it's all covered. Uh, very good, and this is of course what we love to see. Huh? To, uh, this call is actually created for this, to see, to create engagement within the community, connect new people to each other uh, that can help them, them each other to bring these products forward. Um, so thank you, Daniele. If we receive any further questions we will uh, we will let you know by email uh, then it's time to move on to the next uh, part of the program which is the sharing is caring part here we ask everyone prior to the uh, session to send in any questions or challenges that they might have in the field that then the community can help to answer um, we got two questions I will quickly address them as we are running a little bit behind schedule um, the first one is from Paulius Naugalis if I pronounce his name correctly uh, from VLC Photonics. Um, Paulius is asking uh, his fellow professionals uh, whether uh, anyone dealing with electrostatic discharge in an, opt uh, in an electro-optical environment. He says, how do you deal with that? As uh, you know, the ESDs can be a big problem on a highly sensitive, unpackaged, um, inter integrated photonic dyes in optical labs, assembly facilities, assembly facilities, or in the fab house. You know, how do you follow any, I mean, do you follow any standards? Are you pursuing any certified uh, NSI? or ESD, uh, and uh, how do you deal with that? So if you have any insights that you could provide to Paulius, feel free to drop us a message. You will receive his question again after this email, after this session, and then you can respond and we'll put you in touch. 
Second question was from uh, Mike Richardson, who has been already very active in the chat, I see. Uh, Mike is asking, uh, from a supply chain analysis point of view, um, can we identify weaknesses in our supply chain that can jeopardize the vision of increasing pick production volumes? Also here, Mike, uh, we will, uh, of course, give our uh, answer to that after the session, but uh, we will send out this question also to the rest of the audience uh, that can then get in touch with you as well on this. Um, so, moving on to our first keynote speaker, actually, and that's no one less than Kathleen Philips from iMac. Um, Kathleen has been with iMac for 18 years and is now general manager of iMac the Netherlands. Uh, before iMac, she has been with Philips Research for over 12 years. Uh, she has seen the rise of the CMOS industry and has worked closely on the development of technology that we use in our everyday lives. Uh, Kathleen, can you share your screen, unmute yourself? I think that's all been done. I can see you on the screen. Again, if anyone has any questions, drop them in the chat so we can uh, put them on to Kathleen. Kathleen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so this is the Photonics Forum, and still I'm going to talk about CMOS because that's in fact the context that I come from. Being at IMEC, uh, IMEC have been at um, have been at, uh, at, at the heart of the CMOS industry and even at the origin of the CMOS roadmaps, many of them at least for over 50 years. Um, I think it's worthwhile, worthwhile reflecting a bit on what we've learned from that industry and to which extent it can be transposed onto the photonics industry. Um, so I said I'm with IMIC. In fact, I'm responsible for, I'm general manager for the IMIC part in Hall Center. Hall Center is um, the first presence of IMIC in uh, Holland, uh, founded in 2006, in fact, together with TNO. Uh, by now, we have a second site being Wageningen, the One Planet site, a collaboration with Radboud and Wageningen University. Uh, but today, this reflects a bit on the work that we've been doing at, at Holst, um, which is focused on enabling technologies, uh, design, and uh, bringing those to applications. So, uh, starting with the lessons from CMOS, uh, a very crucial one uh, at, at the core of why CMOS has been so successful, successful is the fact that we have been able to focus. Less is more, CMOS roadmaps have been solely optimized for compute. All kinds of compute through the, throughout the decades, but always with compute in mind, serving higher volume, lower cost, smaller uh, sizes, uh, faster throughput, better computation. And this has proven to be a success story, not only for, for the volume in compute, but also to get this technology adopted in different domains even though it has never been optimized, never really been optimized for uh, analog or RF, today most of the volume in analog and RF is in CMOS, despite of the presence of specialty technologies that are definitely needed if you're going to go for high power, for instance. But if you can do functions, even if they're RF or millimeter wave, as the example shown here, if you can do that in CMOS, you're going to choose CMOS simply because it's cheaper, it's widely available, there's multiple sources, and from a business perspective, it's always better. Plus, the design community has also adapted its practices and its skills to deal with technologies as is. So again, even though CMOS has never been optimized for, for instance, millimeter wave design, we have managed to do like 100 gigahertz radar in CMOS, plain vanilla, using different design methodologies, the digital design styles uh, applied in the analog domain. In the end, the design community adapts. I'm not saying that this recipe is going to be fully applicable to photonics um, because it's simply true that you're going to need to serve different markets than compute, which is so much uh, volume. But today uh, we see that volumes in photonics are basically driven by Datacom. And it's also fair to say that Datacom has driven technology. That's why we have um, basically the lasers available at, at two selected wavelengths, primarily, if you're going to look at the volumes. Um, what does it mean for our platforms? I believe it's going to be very crucial for our platforms to find a balance between offering the exact right device that the designers would prefer to have, the exact right wavelength, tunability, whatever, versus being selective and making choices where you cannot please everyone, 
example, where at least for the devices that you're going to make, you're going to have the full design enablement. You're going to be able to deliver um, in a fast enough time frame. You have the supply chain in place and all of that. And it's not going to be perfect for all markets. It may the device you're offering, the catalog you're offering may not serve all the, the, the segments. Maybe health designs, maybe uh, automotive designs need to adapt and follow simply what's in the automotive catalog. It does help you to grow your technology stronger uh, if you are able to focus to a certain extent. Lesson number two is about integration. Um, I've spent my design career on integrating everything on a single die. System on chip has been the holy grail in CMOS for the past decades. Uh, it started off by adding data conversion to, to digital dies. Um, from there on, we've been adding RF and ultimately um, millimeter wave design. Simply because it made sense, it was reducing cost. Uh, it was in fact improving performance, though initially people were very skeptical about this. Um, like in the 90s, there were strong beliefs that if you want to do a good transceiver, you would always need bipolar. It would never be done in CMOS today. All Bluetooth volume, which is, by the way, the biggest um, volume uh, um, connectivity technology around, so it ships in the billions per year. All of it is full standard CMOS, simply because it's the only way to meet the price point. And in the end, again, designers adapt and they make it work in the technology that they have at hand. So in CMOS, the winning game has been to integrate everything on a single die. We are not there in photonics and we probably are never going to be there to the extent that CMOS has achieved it. But it's true that today um, photonics really needs a lot of building blocks being stacked together. So you have light sources, you have different picks that need to be added. You have the control and the steering electronics that need to be added. All of these interfaces at cost, for instance, because of test or assembly cost, they add risk, uh, they add losses, noise. So they are a burden. Um, to show you an example, this is where we are today. Uh, what you see here, um, let's see with my pointer. Uh, what you see here in the left top picture is an optical phase array. Um, and in the blue rectangle there, you see a connection to a fiber uh, that's going to connect it to, to a laser again. Um, so the optical phase array is one die. It's controlled by the board which is beneath, which is the electronic steering board. On top of the phase array, we want to uh, integrate a laser. Uh, and in fact, as part of the growth fund, we're going to do both a flip chip integration, uh, the part as well as a transfer printing method, which in the end is going to be scalable to higher volumes, but, but needs much more development. Um, and you see that there's quite a bit of, of technology here that still needs to be uh, developed in order to get to a close integration of the various dyes. The closer they're going to be, the less loss you're going to have, the less risk you're going to have. But nevertheless, integration here on a single chip is, is an illusion. So you're going to need to put a lot of effort on very strong assembly and good integration flows. Um, just as an illustration of the transfer printing, um, so that was the bottom example that I showed on previous slide. So this is a full stack as we're processing today, but where we also need to, to take the next step and basically co-integrate with indium phosphide laser in this case. Um, so that's the ambition. That's the ambition in terms of integration level that we want to achieve, even though the red part and the, the yellowish part here are two different technology platforms by origin, we're going to try to intimately couple them via micro transfer printing in this case. Which brings me to the last uh, lesson. It's a very obvious one. Uh, I think Avid addressed it already in its in its opening. It's very obvious that um, success here is either a shared uh, endeavor or it's not going to happen at all. CMOS has been successful because of the very, very strong industry alignment. Um, again, coming from IMIC, I can witness on that. IMIC has been a place where competitors, fierce competitors in very harsh business conditions were willing to come together and align pre-competitively on their roadmaps just in order to share the risk, to share the investment. Um, 
and understanding that the success of each individual, in fact, depends on the strength of the entire ecosystem. Um, so let's bring together the entire ecosystem from su suppliers all the way to application partners. Let's also bring together the academia with industry and in fact also real world um, applications. Because it's true today that we're still kind of in an ivory tower with this technology. It really takes expert knowledge. It's in the hands of, of really expert people, often in academia, which is great, but we're only going to be successful if we have this technology being used, like for instance, by farmers for the fruit ripeness methods. Um, as long as we don't have the entire education system and ecosystem involved here, um, it means that we're still kind of small um, and we have not reached our goals yet. And this is where I want to keep it. Um, hoping this has inspired you to take next steps. Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. It was a very interesting presentation. I think uh, integration is key, as you mentioned. There's quite some lessons that we can learn from the CMOS industry. And uh, last but not least, uh, working not alone, but all together to make sure that this technology will be used in the field by all the different applications that can need it. Um, I am looking in the questions to see if anything dropped in. There's a comment uh, from, uh, from uh, Mike uh, from Optic BB. He says that Dr. Patrick Leishing from Toptica Photonics says CMOS always wins. Um, it's not really a question. And I think that there is definitely some, uh, some uh, good lessons that, uh, that Kathleen uh, uh, sketched from us for us to, uh, to take from the CMOS industry. Uh, so let's make sure together that we can take the next steps also with growth and with the collaboration with IMAC to bring this to the next level. Uh, there is one further question uh, I can see here. Um, it says, we have a startup that has technology to support fabrication of qubits in uh, silicon. Is IMAC interested? I'm not sure if you can comment on that uh, now, uh, Kathleen. Yeah, definitely. We're always, it sounds very, very intriguing. So definitely interested uh, in talking. Yes, absolutely. Okay, good. Uh, so we'll put you guys in touch uh, to take this discussion further offline. Um, so thanks again, uh, Kathleen. Very nice to, uh, to have this presentation from you. Thank you for your time. And then we have to go on to the next speaker, our last speaker of today. And his name is Twan Korthorst. He's the director of Photonic Solutions for Synopsis. Uh, before that, he was the CEO of Phoenix Software, which actually got acquired by Synopsis in 2018. Um, Twan. I thank you very much uh, to be here today, and I'm sure your presentation will be as interesting as uh, Kathleen. So please, if you can share your screen, and then the floor is totally yours. Uh, thanks, Jorn, for the uh, invitation to participate today, and I'll start sharing my screen. So I hope you can indeed see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, yes, my name is Twan Korthorst. I work for Synopsis and I'll discuss why Synopsys is investing in photonics. Um, first of all, for people that don't know Synopsys, Synopsys is a US headquartered company active in electronic design automation, in semiconductor IP, especially electrical IP, and in software security and software integrity. So we consider silicon, IP design tools, emulation systems, and software as a complete stack to uh, create a full, let's say, solution for the traditional semiconductor industry to go from process fundamentals in the foundries to complete deployment of systems, including the software stack. So with a global presence and more than 16,000 people uh, around the, the world, uh, I wanted to highlight that we actually have two offices in the Netherlands, one at the high tech campus in Eindhoven and one at Kennis Park in Enschede, where I'm located. And in Enschede, we have around 20 people where we have around 75 people in, in Eindhoven. And in Eindhoven, um, um, let's say, so in the Netherlands, it's mainly R&D staff. So people developing IP, developing design solutions, uh, either for digital design or for photonics design um, or for process and, and TCAT uh, tools. Um, so 
Synopsis, traditionally as an EDA company, electronic design automation, started more than 35 years ago, um, recognized early the importance of optics and photonics. And this started in 2010 when LED lighting started to bring optics closer to, let's say, the traditional semiconductor manufacturing. And Synopsis acquired Optical Research Associates that was providing free space optical simulation tools, including being able to simulate the behavior of LEDs and uh, phosphor layers in those LEDs. Then Synopsis acquired Arsoft Design Group, focused on photonics, photonic integrated devices and integrated photonic systems and circuits. In 2014, with Brandenburg GmbH in Germany, uh, focused on automotive lighting, and then, like Jorn mentioned, Phoenix Software, the company where I originate from in 2018, Litec in France in 2020, and only a couple of weeks ago, Synopsis announced the investment together with Juniper Networks in a new company um, in the space of laser integration for silicon photonics. So looking at that, you can really see that Synopsys covers a full spectrum of optical and photonic design solutions and services. And we continue to, let's say, build tools to, um, to serve the um, uh, demands of the market. So photonics people um, and photonic integrated circuit people are actually distributed around the globe. So we have people in the US, in Canada, in the Netherlands, in France, Armenia, India, Korea, Taiwan, China, and Japan. And you all already recognize that we are on one hand close to foundries that are key partners for future enablement of photonic integrated circuit PTKs and close to key customers that are using our solutions and are using integrated photonics technologies. So what do we see at Synopsis? Well, um, as mentioned already, it started with this investment in traditional optics. Um, and, and we heard today about lacroscopy and, and, and uh, lens design for this uh, uh, clinical instruments is something that we are very strong at, for instance. But you see a trend from traditional optics to micro optics to nano photonics with diaphragmatic optics lenses and flat optics for AR, VR. Um, discrete photonics like photo detectors or light sources, CMAG image sensors. So to me, I call this integrated photonics where really the sizes are getting nanoscale and we use traditional semiconductor technology like photonic integrated circuits to serve a wide area of applications. So this is why Synopsys is interested because many of those markets are actually also core markets for our uh, digital design, analog design, and semiconductor IP business groups. So like Kathleen mentioned and, and, and other speakers already today, we see that optical data communication continues to be the main driver for volume and also the main driver for investment. So whether this is for data centers, uh, for telecom, for um, radio fiber or 5G backhaul, um, the trend towards co-package optics and, and optical I.O. between individual GPUs or CPUs, that's what driving a lot of the activity in, in, in the space. Um, what we do recognize is a greater photonic electronic integration and also a migration to more complex form factors like 2.5D and 3D. Uh, so really more towards system uh, in a package instead of system on chip and chiplets are starting to become more and more used in this uh, space. It also triggered major founders interest in photonic enablement. So for a long time it was a kind of boutique activity at institutes at smaller companies leveraging institutes but we see major foundries like Global Foundries or TSMC or Tower Semiconductor and Intel engaging in this uh, space of integrated photonics. And of course, there are additional end markets in health and 3D sensing and computing applications. So what we recognize at Synopsys and especially also at Phoenix Software originating from the European ecosystem is that silicon photonics has gained enormous momentum. And Originally, silicon photonics was all about silicon waveguides, 
what we do see, of course, is the integration of nitride waveguides initially for edge coupling, but now also to be able to go beyond the traditional infrared or mid infrared wavelengths and offer visible light uh, capabilities. And then there is uh, all kinds of technology developed for bringing in the light source and whether that is flip chip, whether that is, um, um, let's say, transfer printing, whether that is uh, heterogeneous integration or even research and monolithic integration, it is still to be seen what kind of technology will actually prevail. Um, but what we do see at Synopsys is the high speed uh, uh, digital electronics coming closer to the photonics. Maybe the laser still separate or bringing the analog um, electronics for readout or for driving the photonics uh, together with the photonics either monolithically or again in, in a um, two and a half D or three D uh, vision. But overall, we see really the coming closer together of electronics and photonics. What is also still uh, the case is that the PDKs are not as mature as we're used to in electronics. Um, what we also see is that many of the larger companies engaging want to use flows and, flows and tools like an electronic design automation. And there is an emerging ask for IP for photonics, ready to go building blocks, either electrical building blocks or photonic building blocks that can help them shorten the design cycle times. So with that said, Synopsys started to um, develop, let's say, software tools to help the industry and to move from homegrown tools or domain specific tools to enable traditional IC designers with their EDA tools and developing an electronic photonic design automation environment where you now can not only target the experts, but also non-experts and really widen the amount of designers that can help us to build systems using these technologies. So marrying photonic design automation and electronic design automation into one common platform where you can co-design the photonics and electronics and do trade-off and optimization. Again, mainly focus today on the optical IO technology roadmap, where we bring together the device tools, either electrical device level or photonic device level, the photonic layout with opto designer, with signal level simulation with OPSIM, photonic DRC and LVS with, with IC validator, and the high speed service IP that we already had at Synopsys, we developed Opto Compiler, industry's only unified electro optical design platform, where you can really um, follow a design paradigm that people in IC and CMOS design are used to with a schematic driven layout flow with integrated DRC and LVS and simulation. So you can really reduce cycle times and improve uh, quality of results. And then on top of that, we're starting to see this need for 3D, uh, 3D design with multi-die routing and thermal analysis when you stack those photonic devices, uh, photonic integrated circuits, electrical circuits all together as system in a package. So that drives our internal roadmap and R&D priorities to work with the ecosystem um, and um, help the uh, industry to accelerate adoption. So Synopsys is committed to provide the most efficient design platform um, to support universities and consortia and collaborate with foundries closely um, to bring photonic IC technology in the hands of um, much more end users and applications. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Twan. It was a, a good presentation. I'm sure the audience also uh, appreciated it. Um, there I see no questions yet in the chat, but I might have one for you. Uh, you mentioned, um, you know, also the sensing potential. So is that something that, how does Synopsys look at that? Is there uh, the silicon nitride you mentioned for integration? Uh, but do you think that there's a big potential behind this market? Because now uh, you were saying Datacom is really the big driver for the next, for, for some time. But how, how do you look at that? 
Yeah, the, I, so that's a good question, Jorn. Actually, one of our our customers, Rockley Photonics, um, I think is pretty well known in the ecosystem right now, yep. working on a wearable solution where they use, let's say, uh, an integrated photonic circuit um, using uh, multiple wavelengths to really non-invasively monitor all kinds of uh, yeah, bio health markers. Um, and actually, if those kind of applications bring it to the cost point, either as a wearable or potentially even disposables, that can drive an enormous volume into the foundries. Because actually, when you look critically at tele and datacom, wafer volumes, um, uh, they don't grow or scale as rapidly as some of those consumer or health oriented applications. Mm. So, yes. so we, um, and therefore the importance of, of uh, light sources and, and waveguide systems being able to cover those kind of wavelengths is, is also important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and indeed, I think uh, I think you're right on that. Uh, and uh, another point you mentioned was the the lower maturity level of the PDKs, right? So how do you think we can overcome this? I mean, you you also sketched uh, out the you know the benefits of the of the software tools that you guys develop at Synopsys, but are there any other steps that need to be taken in order to maturitize uh, the PDKs? Yeah. Again, a very relevant question. And in Europe, we had, of course, several investments in uh, early on in, in let's say, um, around 2010 with, with bringing up uh, processes at IMAC or Cialetti or at Heinrich Hertz in Berlin or with uh, initially Eindhoven and, and Lyonix for nitrite and enium phosphide. Uh, and then we got the uh, pilot lines. Um, uh, I, th I believe that when you really look at CMOS and how they bring up processes, a lot of that is is just running wafers and learning from that manufacturing. So scaling mm. manufacturing and maturing the process is 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 an art and is just running a lot of materials, learning from that and putting that into models. So I think the biggest gap is really that you're not able yet to create a design validated completely by simulation and be 100% confident that it comes out of the fab as designed. That is so, where CMOS uh, is, and that is where we're not yet with photonics, which mm -hmm. requires close collaboration with people like, uh, let's say, uh, Synopsys or other software vendors and the foundries working together to bring uh, models to a higher maturity stage. Yeah, so we need more volumes to get more data in order to make the simulations more, um, let's say, accurate. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think there's one question in the chat, uh, again by Mike Richardson from Optech BB. He's saying uh, they have discussions with uh, the Indian government to create a deep tech hackathon uh, supporting the semicon fabrication. Uh, he's steering and he's uh, asking whether uh, Synopsis is interested to look at the PIC side of things. Uh, the focus is on fabrication. Uh, so we, we actually to... just did a hackathon on analog design in India with hundreds of students participating. Uh, I think it was two months ago. So I'm mm -hmm. definitely interested to, to discuss if and how we can bring photonic integrated circuits into, into the mix. All right, it's good to hear. I'll put you guys in touch. And uh, well, if there's no further questions, then, uh, then I would like to conclude this session. Uh, thank you, Tuan, very much for your time. Um, and thank you all for the audience as well for tuning in today. Um, I hope to see you next time in June. That will be on June 1st. We will be broadcasting live from the Hanover Messe 2022 uh, in Germany, where we will be with four of our partners and taking part in the Dutch Startup Pavilion. Um, so please, uh, we're going to send you this form uh, to make sure to improve the sessions in the future. Uh, just help us and take a couple of minutes to fill this out. The uh, link will be dropped in the chat and there will be a QR code on screen right now that you can scan. Uh, there will be a couple of questions on how we can improve this, what kind of topics we can add to the discussion, any suggestions for speakers that you might have. Uh, please share them with us so we can really create more value for the entire community. Um, yeah, then it leaves me with no other thing to say than to thank you again for your time and see you next month, every first Wednesday of the month. Remember, thank you. Bye-bye.